ministry kind of help as well on their envelope. And uh, anyone else have? Jennifer has something. Good morning, church family. Happy Sabbath. Um, I have a few announcements. Um, tomorrow, the Pathfinders will be meeting from 6 to 8 here at the church. They usually meet on Monday, but because of the meetings, they're going to be switching for this meeting tomorrow at 6 o'clock um, here at the church. And also another announcement, um, this coming, well, mark your calendars, but October the 28th, at 3.30, we will have a induction for the Adventure and Pathfinder Club, where we will come and um, be dedicated to the Lord. Um, so please mark your calendars for that day, and we look forward to seeing you there. Thank you. Kathy, that's one. This is very short and very sweet. Um, we love potluck. We love to eat together. Just one little thing I'd like for you to do when you get done eating and you're ready to go, would you please fold up your chair and just put it against the wall and that way, because sometimes there's just like two or three people left and they're scrambling to get all the chairs put away. So just a little reminder when you get up, Please fold your chair and put it against the wall. Thank you. Any other announcements? All right. Uh, prepare your heart for the divine worship. We'll start it on that. Let's pray. Father, I'm asking, Lord, that your spirit may be with us and even in us. Lord, help us to, to really accept the spirit who will guide us into all truth. And Lord, I'm asking that this worship service, may we do it both in spirit and in truth. And Father, thank you for this blessed day. Help us to keep it holy. For this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. We have... The opening hymn, which will be number 692. 305, yes, sorry.
Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. All right. Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. All right. Now is the time for prayer and praise where we can share our praises throughout the week and our prayer requests. So if there's anyone who would like to start, they can. I have a couple of praises and a prayer request regarding one of the praises. Uh, last Anyways, I gave a health lecture for the church in Norway. It went really well, and they asked me to do more. So that's really exciting. Last night when I arrived back at the house, I found a message from this lady that I've become friends with through virtually, okay? She used to teach, and she now does health, natural health stuff, and she loves gardening, etc. So she asked me about something, and we started talking. And anyways, long story short, she wants to start Bible studies. Amen. And uh, that's really exciting. Please keep her in your prayers. Her name's Nancy. All right. I just want to say... Um, this time last week, my husband requested or put in a prayer request for the school. And the reason being that at that time, we needed to pay the teacher and we needed to pay payroll taxes. And we didn't have what it took to do either one. And praise God, we now have both. Amen. He is good. He is faithful. Everybody wants to praise the Lord. It's <laughs> awesome. I just want to praise the Lord for this beautiful day. And I'm really, really excited. If you all remember my friend Linda and Ellis Jones, um, he's a Baptist minister. And um, I talked to her yesterday, and she said that they were going to Amity today to hear Pastor Michael speak. Mm. So let's just keep that in prayer. I'm so excited to hear that. And I I just praise God for that. Okay. Mr. Sean and Ms. Lisa first. Uh, several praises. Um, my mom is doing better than I expected that she would be after the death of my father, so I just want to praise God for sustaining her. And uh, my son needed to find a different job, and the so he's going for really a formality of an interview next week. And so I praise God for that and uh, please pray that, you know, he will go ahead and get it. And also my daughter scalded her hand, mm. which should have been a very bad injury, but she immediately stuck it in ice cold water and they prayed over her hand several times and there's no damage. Mm. So praise God. The, the neighborhood where I live is a big neighborhood. There's about 12 families. They've been there for about 200 years. They're all completely intermarried, and everybody is related to each other, That's, except for me. Well, the guy across from me has been there 25 years, so he's not really part of the neighborhood either. Yeah, but he is, but you know what I'm saying. So anyhow, the neighbors are nice. I had some welding that needed to be done on my old riding mower, and the neighbor comes over with another neighbor and a welder on the back of the truck, welds it all up for me, and then I said, what do I owe you? He's owed about $10, <laughs> you know, so I gave him 40, you know. And then I didn't realize how soggy wet the soil can get here in Arkansas, and I pulled off the side of the road one day, and that was a big mistake. So this same neighbor came and pulled me out of the mud. And uh, what do I owe you? Oh, ten dollars. I gave him forty. You know. But my mower. I finally bought a new mower. My mower was just. 
And I tried to give it to some different people, but they didn't really need it. And then I thought, oh, that guy, he fixes mowers. And so I called him up yesterday, and I said, you know that mower you fixed for me? It's got some problems, but uh, would you like it? And he says, yeah. Uh, what do you want for it? I said, it's free. I said, but you can't come tomorrow because it was like 5 o'clock on Friday. You can't come tomorrow because it's my Sabbath, you know, but uh, Sunday. And he says, can I come right now? So he got it. <laughs> and he just wanted to give me money. And I wouldn't take his money because to me, it's way more valuable to me to give it to him for free. And I was just so blessed to be able to bless my neighbor because my neighbors have been blessing me. So mm -hmm. that was the blessing. I have a prayer request, but let me tell you the story and why I'm requesting your prayers. There's a place, I live near uh, Magnolia, there's a place for the last two or three weeks I have had and set up a, a display. And, um, and I was, you know, it's one of the most uh, interesting things in that it's the busiest intersection in the whole city almost. Mm -hmm. And people were, were stopping by and, and, uh, they would give donations for different books, and this, and sometimes one lady even stopped by, and said, and she backed up, and said, "The Lord asked me uh, to give you this." And she just ten dollars. She didn't, didn't want to give you anything. Didn't want to buy anything. Didn't want anything. And so, and now this is where your prayer requests come in. Monday of this week, in the same location. The police came, mm. and they said, you can't set up here anymore unless you give us $200 for 30 days, for once a year. You can only do this once a year, and it's going to cost you $200. And they were not very kind. Mm. And I have uh, that really disturbed me, mm -hmm. and it also discouraged me. Mm -hmm. So keep me in your prayers. Yeah. All right. If there is not any, do one more. I just want to uh, bring this prayer request to the church uh, from. Watched uh, Pastor Kevin Powell asked me to drop uh, literature like Adventist literature magazines and the great controversy to a gentleman who is a Methodist pastor and is looking for the truth. He's searching the truth. So I dropped the magazines to him. He's a very busy man, but he did say, um, if I have time, I'll read it. So let us pray that God and make the time for him so that he can uh, go through those uh, materials. All right, there's not anyone else we can, oh, there's one more in there. I have prayer request for my youngest daughter, father-in-law with cancer. And I have prayer requests for my son that will be having court the 10th of this month at 1 o'clock for an accusation that he has, is not guilty of. And for me and my husband, uh, financial situation. There's not anyone else will go to kneel in prayer. Can I have the mic? Can I have the mic?
Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this Sabbath and that we can all rest. Um, thank you for all of the praises, specifically um, Miss Kathy's friend getting Bible studies. And please be with her, that it will go well. And um, thank you for Mr. Sean's neighbor and his hospitality. And please be with him. Um, be with Mr. Elroy and him being discouraged, Lord. Be with him. Send the Holy Spirit to encourage him. Um, be with all of the prayer requests that uh, I cannot remember, please. Thank you for the praises, and please help us to learn more about you today, and be blessed in Jesus' name. Amen. Time for the offering where uh, we can all participate. Pray that the, the uh, deacons will come up. Let's have prayer. Thank you, Father, for your loving kindness. Thank you for uh, fighting for us and our families. And the extra, we pray that we know it's all yours and we want to give back and help. And we just pray that you would bless uh, the funds that are given today to forward your work. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now it's time for the children's story. Angeline White is going to be given that.
Good morning. Ooh, are you okay? All right, so today, how the others are making their way up front, I'm going to tell you a quick little story about a young boy. I guess he was pretty young. And I'm going to name him Joey, okay? Now, okay, Joey was from a very special family, all right? He had so many siblings. Do you guys have siblings? Mm -hmm. How would you like to have 12 siblings? Ooh, me personally? I don't think so. <laughs> um, but this young boy had 12 siblings. Now, out of this, now Joey's dad in total had 13 kids that we know of for right now. Um, and he loved Joey. He really, 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 really liked him. This made Joey's other 12 brothers very, very not happy. Let me say that. They were... Oh, okay. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> yes, we are talking about the story of Joseph. Since Joseph's, Joseph's dad really, really liked him and his brothers weren't happy, they were like, they were always like, man, we gotta do the cleaning, we gotta, we gotta organize everything, we gotta take care of the sheep, we gotta go far, walk and do all of dad's orders, whereas Joseph is just chilling, you know? Why is he the one who just gets to chill at home, hanging with dad and mom, and we have to do all the work? They were not happy. One day, Joseph's, Joseph's dad called him, called Joseph. He was like, my son, guess what? I got you a present. You guys know the present? Um, uh, coat with many colors. Yes. He got him a coat with many colors. It was beautiful. And every, he would wear it. And the brothers was like, I don't have a coat with many colors. My coat barely even has one color. I, why, how come dad gave him a coat with many colors? And you know, back in those days, when you got all that material, all that fancy, fancy ink to make coats with many colors, that's a pretty expensive coat. It's like getting a coat from a top brand nowadays. And they're like, how come, where's my coat? You know, they were not happy. So Joseph's brothers are like, you know what? Mm -mm, this is not gonna do. I do not want I'm sick and tired of having Joseph get all this stuff. I want something too. Something needs to be done to Joseph. So I'm pretty sure you guys know the story of what happened. They were blinded by jealousy and they took Joseph and they did some very, very mean and bad things to Joseph. <laughs> yes, <laughs> they did throw him to a pit and they, they sold him, yes. Um, so what does this teach us? I know sometimes we have siblings and maybe even friends and like you see them and they may have things that you want. They, their lives seem to be better than yours. And like you're like, man, I wish I had that coat. I wish I had those shoes. I wish I had that fancy shirt with the fancy colors on it. But if we, are too, ooh, that was a big word, ooh. If we get too immersed with the different things of <laughs> this world and the different, mercy, colors, let me say that, colors of this world, <laughs> and we want the things that our friends have, that our other siblings have, maybe even our older siblings, we can get very jealous and we can do crazy and crazy things that God would not like. So even though we see other people with things that we want, we should be thankful for the good things that we have and not wish for other people's things because sometimes they worked hard for their things or even they don't even know why they have these things and they think that it's not even a lot for them, but just because you're coveting, well, just, you know, the commandments say, thou shalt not covet. So that's the 10th commandment. 
we should not have these, we should not want to take other people's things. We should be thankful for what we have, thankful for what we get, and know that if we truly, truly do want something, you can ask your parents, you can ask God, and if it is his will, God will give it to you, all right? So who would like to pray? Oh, wow, okay. Um, let's have you pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for everything. Help us to have a good Sabbath, and help us to have a good rest of the day. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may all go back to your seats. Thank you. The scripture reading today is 2 Timothy 2, verse 15. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Hello again, everyone. Hopefully your week has been a good one. For me, it was a quick one. Let me set this up really quick. Actually, go this way. All right, perfect. Hopefully, as the presentation goes on, that the letters won't be too small. So. <laughs> so, with that, let's, before we begin, let's pray and ask for the Holy Spirit to guide us. And we'll touch on a topic that really caught my attention. And hopefully, it makes sense to you all. And by God's grace, that we can learn warnings from this. So, let's pray. Our King, at this moment, Lord, I, I am asking that you may please be with my words. Father, oftentimes I, I, I can even speak too fast or, or even too slow to, to where it really throws the attention off, off of people. But Lord, I'm, I'm praying that your angels may draw nigh, Lord. Be with the, the hearers and also, Lord, be with me. I'm praying that ultimately may you be exalted and that you may be glorified. Father, show us things that, that will come to pass. And Father, help us to, to really be better equipped, rightly dividing your word. For this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, now for today's presentation, I will be touching on this one account that Jesus was showing the people. And me, I, I used to, before coming to the school, I would do Bible studies. I, I, I would still do it, but it's not, it's not in the same magnitude. It's not as much as how I used to do it before. And one of the main topics that I, I tend to come across when it, when it comes to like the doctrines of Adventism and, and, of course, speaking with people and the questions that they have has to do with the state of the dead, and which they're, they're genuine. I, I, don't think, I, haven't think, I don't think I've met anyone that, that were not genuinely looking for truth. And one of the things that they bring up is this parable. Some of you, if not all of you, are familiar with this parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Now, I say a parable, but I, I, I really plan, by God's grace, to show you all that, you know, what does the Bible have to say about it, you know? And, and this is one of those accounts, whenever someone would present it to me, I would try to avoid, if I'm being honest with you. I would try to, like, make my way around it. And, and try to go back to, to what I had to say. But as people kept bringing it up constantly, I realized that, okay, I have to address it. I can't necessarily just go around it and, and ignore that, that this, this isn't a thing. Because really what it looks like in, in this passage when Jesus was presenting this is that, you know, right after you die, 
you know, <laughs> these people are still conscious. So, yes, it's really important to, to check it out. So as, as we move on, I, I pray that, you know, things may, that we may really see what, what God really wanted to show us through this parable. Through this parable. And the, one of the arguments that I've seen that people use when it, when it comes to it being a parable is because of the way it starts off. We see in, in these different instances in which we see the parables, they start off with saying a certain man or a certain person, a certain man. Like, it's just constant throughout these parables. And I've seen that, and I studied it out, and I, and I realized it was, there was this one instance where it was not the case. <laughs> are, you, are you all familiar with the Good Samaritan? You know, and it's, it sounds like a parable, because here Jesus, it says in Luke chapter 10, verse 30, and Jesus answering said, and he uses that phrase again, a certain man. However, when it comes to this passage, we're actually told that it was a real event. And this, this isn't to say like, oh, what are you doing? You're just making it worse and worse. But rather, I just want you all to, to, to know that. Like when it comes to saying, oh, it's just a parable because Jesus said a certain person or a certain man. It's like, well, think again. Because here, this, this parable of the Good Samaritan, it was actual, an actual event. Now, the reason why Jesus used it wasn't because it was an actual event. What, it's because people knew it. They, they were familiar with that, that event that happened. And here it even mentions in Desire of Ages that the priest and the Levite that were mentioned in that parable were actually there listening to Jesus as he was giving the parable. And, yeah, imagine how they felt. <laughs> it's like, you know, this, this Levite, you know, <clears throat> by the way, he's, he's in the crowd, but this Levite, he did this. You can picture the, the Levite, you know, he's like, oh, he's talking about me. But he doesn't say it. But here, it gives you the reason why Jesus gave this lesson. is One, because it says in the previous one, it says, yeah, it says, this was no imaginary scene, but an actual occurrence which was known to be exactly as represented. In other words, the people knew it. They, they were familiar with it. And here... It gives a reason why Jesus gave this, this lesson. And I didn't know this. And it's actually, it says, in the story of the Good Samaritan, Jesus gave a picture of himself and his mission. So Jesus, he uses illustrations to show not necessarily that these things happen. But the fact is, like, like it's, it's really to present truth to these people. And... As we go on, we consider who Jesus was talking to in regards to this rich man and Lazarus passage. He was talking to the Pharisees. It's like, okay, what, what does that have to do with anything? I started to, to, to look around and say, okay, what do the Pharisees believe? And we see this one instance in which Paul, he, he, he was in the middle of these, these two groups of people, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And he realizes that these were two different people. And notice what, does he, what he says. He says, men and brethren, I am a Pharisee. The son of a Pharisee, and he gives what they believe. Of the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am called in question. Now you see here they, they were divided because of that. And, he, and it, it mentions here in Acts 23, verse 7, it says... And when he had so said, there arose a dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the multitude was divided. And he gives the reason why. It says, For the Sadducees say, There is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit. But the Pharisees, they profess both. And as I was looking at this, I, I, it, really, it really caught my attention. Like These were people that were... If not, like, they were supposed to teach the people the truth. And look what, look what like, the Sadducees, they, they didn't even believe in the resurrection. Not even an angel. It's like, what do you even do with those passages where you, you clearly see an angel being presented? It's like, what, do you allegorize it? And yet these were the people, the smart people of that day. The philosophers, I guess, if you put it in other words. But... Here it mentions that the Pharisees, they believed in, in the hope and the resurrection 
up the dead. It sounds good, right? It's like, oh, praise God. But I started to look more, I wanted to look more into the details. What exactly do they, do they believe? And I came across this document. Some of you, if not all of you, are probably familiar with Josephus. And here, I, I saw this document that was translated into English, of course, but it gives his discourse to the Greeks concerning Hades. And it's really interesting, because in this document, he tries to really try to connect with the Greeks. He's like, look, we don't, we, 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 we're pretty close when it comes to what we believe. And look what it says in this document. I just highlighted some of them. I'm going to make it bigger, but it's just to show you, you know, that really anyone can, can find this. But here it mentions in the highlighted portion. It says, wherein are contained, it's talking about Hades, contain the souls of the righteous and the unrighteous. Now, to make it bigger, here, Josephus, which he was a Pharisee, if I'm not mistaken, he was given more descriptions of Hades. And he says, in this region, there is a certain place set apart. Now, don't, don't ask me to explain everything. I don't understand how they believe in the resurrection and yet, you know, still conscience. But this is what it says. How there was a certain place set apart as a lake of unquenchable fire. And it says, when the unjust and those who have been disobedient to God and have given honor to such idols as have been the vain operations of the hands of men as to God himself shall be adjudged to this everlasting punishment. So they believe in this area where the unjust they will go to. And is everlasting. And as I, as I continue reading on, I found more interesting things to make it bigger. Here it says, and this is talking about now, you know, he just finished talking about the unjust. Now he's talking about the just. Where, where do the just go? He says, with whom there is no place of toil, no burning heat, no piercing cold, nor are any briars there. It says, but the countenance of the fathers and of the just, which they see, always smiles upon them. It sounds good. But then here it says, while they wait for that rest and eternal new life in heaven, which is to succeed this region, this is the place that is, this is what it's called. It's this place we call the bosom of Abraham. Here, Josephus was explaining to the Greeks, look, we're similar in ideas. You know, we, we do believe in this eternal punishment, but it's for the wicked. But there also, there also is this place in which the just go to, and, and this place is called the bosom, we call it, the Pharisees call it, the bosom of Abraham. And if, if you're not getting it yet, here it mentioned, it's talking about when people die, what happens to them. Here he's, he's admitting that they believe that, that the people are still conscious even after death. And I've, I've even done more research, which I haven't made in this presentation yet. I, I need to update it. But it, you can even see Greek influence when it comes to the, to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, which, yeah, it's, it's, it says a lot because they were influenced of their way to thinking. And these were, the, again, these were the rulers of the people. These were people that were supposed to present truth to them, and yet... This is what they believed. <laughs> and it gives more descriptions. It says, describing now this gap in between the, the righteous and the wicked. It says, for a chaos deep and large is fixed between them. And so much that a just man that has compassion upon them cannot be admitted. Nor can one that is unjust, if he were bold enough to attempt it, pass over it. So in other words, here you have these two regions, and in the middle of it, there's this chaos, or this, this gulf, if you will, that's fixed between them, that they cannot cross over one to the other side, not, neither the other side to, to the other. <laughs> and we're actually told this. It says, this is speaking about the disciples now. It says, they have heard so much of the doctrines and the so-called scientific theories of the Sadducees that the impression made on their minds in regards 
to the resurrection was vague. It says they scarcely knew what the resurrection from the dead could mean. They were unable to take in the great subject. And this is touching on whenever Jesus said very plainly, look, I'm going to die, and in three days, I'm going to rise. And yet, you see, you see right after that, you can see them still questioning, like, what does he mean by that? And, and we, we tend to point fingers at them. It's like, oh, look, they don't know. How come they don't know? They can't. It's because of their rulers. Here you see the Sadducees, they didn't even believe in a resurrection. But then the Pharisees, on the other hand, they're, they're, no even, they're not even better. They're, they're still believing that you're still conscious even after death. It's, it's all confusion overall. And because of this, the people or the disciples were not able to grasp the understanding. So with that, yeah, it even mentions in, in, in another passage, it says the doctrine of a conscious state of existence between death and the resurrection was held by many of those who were listening to Christ's words. Now, this is talking about the rich man and Lazarus. And remember again, who was Jesus talking to? The Pharisees. And here, it's very plain. It's like, look, this is what they believed. And I just wanted to show it through other means. Like, look, like, this wasn't made up. <laughs> this is what they believed. And... It's interesting. It says the Savior knew of their ideas. And he framed his parable so as to inculcate important truths through these preconceived opinions. He held up before his hearers a mirror wherein they might see themselves in their true relation to God. So he, he framed truth in a way that where they can understand. But at the same time, it kind of go, goes against what they, what they believed. And I'll show you why it kind of goes against. Like, although he, he, he showed it in a way that, that they can understand, in the parable itself, it's like, wow, really? And I'll show you. Okay, so now we're going to the, to the, to the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Here it says in Luke 16, 19, it says, There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen, and he basically lived, like, good every day. And it mentions another person. It says, and there was a certain beggar named Lazarus. And this is one of the reasons why people say it's real. It's like, oh, because he mentioned his name. And I do believe, like, Jesus gave this name for a reason. And I'll explain as we get to the end of this parable. He says, which was laid at his gate full of sores. But then as you go on, you see these descriptions. And it says, and desiring, this is talking about the, the Lazarus, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover the dogs came and licked his sores. It's like, okay, why is Jesus choosing these words right here? You know, here you have the crumbs. Here you have, apparently this man is a, a, a poor man. <laughs> and you see this rich man's table, and you see this imagery of dogs. You know, there's another passage in Scripture which actually uses these same elements. There's this case where there was a woman from Greek, that was a, that was a Greek, a Syrophoenician, Syrophoenician woman, came to Jesus. It says here in Mark 7, 26, it says, And she besought him that he would cast forth the devil out of her daughter. But notice Jesus' response. But Jesus said unto her, let the children first be filled, for it is not me to take the children's bread and to cast it unto the dogs. And she answered and said unto them, Yes, Lord, yet the dogs under the table eat of the children's crumbs. And Jesus honored that. He said, And he said unto her, For this saying, Go thy way, the devil is gone out of thy daughter. Now people look at this and they're like, You know, why is Jesus talking like this does he does he really believe that she's a dog no what is he doing he's saying things that really the disciples believed now think about it he doesn't necessarily believe it but he's showing the people like look this is what you believe it's the same exact case with the rich man and Lazarus he's like look I'm gonna say it in a way that really 
how, what you believe, but I'm going to give it a twist. So here we see in the parable of the dogs, the table, and the crumbs. And again, where else in Scripture doesn't mention those things? It's when it talks about the woman. Because really the Gentiles were considered even dogs. So here in, the, in this parable, you see this, this man named Lazarus. He's a Gentile, in other words. But yet, look who ends up going to the bosom of Abraham. And it says in verse 22, And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into where? Abraham's bosom. Now, I can picture the Pharisees hearing this, and they, they, they're like, whoa, there's no way. Because what they believe is that the just goes to Abraham's bosom, And yet this beggar, who was a Gentile, by description, because they, they call them dogs. It's like, you know, we can't cast the food to, to the dogs. This Gentile ends up going to where the just are to go. So really, right here, even though he's, he's using the, frame, the framework of their understanding, it goes against to what they believe. And here it says the rich man also died and was buried, and he ended up being in, a, being in hell. <laughs> This is like a whole, this is mind-boggling to them because, again, remember what Jesus said, you know, it's, it's hard for a rich man to enter into heaven, right? And then you see the disciples, they, 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 they ask the question, you know, who then can be saved? It's like, why would they ask that? It's because they were taught that, you know, you know, the blessings that you see when it comes to riches, it's a guarantee. It's like, okay, you're guaranteed. You're going to make it to Abraham's bosom. But in reality, that's not the case. So here, Jesus is really showing them through the, through the mirror that they believe. He's like, oh, no. You think you're righteous because you're rich. That's not the case. This, this person who's poor, he's going to be in, in Abraham's bosom. And here, we see when it comes to, to this, this rich man who he puts his trust on. He says, he cried and said... You know, he didn't say Father God. He put his trust in Abraham. He said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But here, you know, he mentions about his life. But it says in verse 26, and besides all this, when it comes to like wanting to send Lazarus to him, he says, between us and you, there's a great gulf fixed. So that they which would pass from hence to you, they can't. Neither can they pass to us which would come from thence. So in other words, look, it is true that there, are, there is a separation between the just and the righteous. There, there is this, this gulf that, that you really can't cross. And yet you see, you see this, this um, rich man, he still insists in verse 27, he says, Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldst send, send him to my father's house. And he says, Because I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Here, you see, you see this mindset, this, this, what this man believed. He believed that, although dead, he could still come back and talk to his brothers and give them the warning. But here, Abraham, he says, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. In other words, that, this, there's, a great, there's a great goal fixed. That can't even happen. So don't, don't even try to, 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 to believe that the fact that you know, people you know, that are dead can come to you and communicate to you and give you warnings. Because they have Moses and the prophets. This is sufficient for them to be prepared. And it reminds me of specifically that. Let's see. Okay. Yes, in the passage of Isaiah 20, you actually see very similar things, ideas. It says, To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Do you all know the context of that passage? It's actually talking about sorcerers and, and those who believe that you can communicate with the dead. He says, look, 
this isn't sufficient to the law and to the testimony. If they don't speak according to this, it doesn't matter what you see. It doesn't matter what, what appears unto you. This is the standard, not what we, what we conceive with our eyes. And here, again, you see this person. He's still, he's still present to Abraham about this. He said, nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And then it says, and he said unto them, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Now, I would say this. Although there is this great goal fixed in between the dead and the living, God does have the right, and he does have the authority to really bring those people back. And this is one of the reasons why I believe Jesus gave this person by the name of Lazarus, because even that's what happens later on. In John 11, I believe, it mentions this person named Lazarus who was dead, and he actually did his crowning act in raising him from the dead. And like the news started spreading. And instead of believing in Jesus, the Pharisees, they hardened their heart. It's like we have to kill not only Jesus, but Lazarus too. And this is what I believe what he's referring to, why he gives the name. Because it's like, you know, I know it's going to happen later on. That even if one rises from the dead, they won't b believe. Now, what does this have to do with us today? We're told that there's two great errors that's going to be in the last days. One is this idea of the immortality of the soul. And two, Sunday sacredness. Now, when it comes to, I'm, I'm just going to focus in on specifically the immortality of the soul first, and then touch a little bit on the Sunday sacredness. Because here it says, while the former, speaking about the immortality of the soul, believing that once you die, I mean, you're, you're not really dead, you're still conscience. While the former lays the foundation of spiritualism. It's like, think about it. Why, why would this, this idea that you live forever bring up this doctrine of, of spiritualism? Because if you believe that they're still alive, I mean, doesn't that you know, lead, you believe, to lead you to believe that you can still communicate with them? It's like, you know, he's, he's dead, but he's still conscious. They're, ha you're, they're having this same mindset of, of the, this rich man. He's like, look, he, he, he can still, he's still able to cross that great gulf that's fixed and to communicate with people, even though he's dead. But, but Abraham, which really God, he's like, no, no, no. You can't do that. It's not possible. Here it mentions in the great controversy as well, this idea, this idea of, you know, adopting the immortality of the soul. And I, I've always wondered about this passage right here, because here it says, the Protestants of the United States will be foremost in stretching their hands across the gulf to grasp the hands of spiritualism. And I stop right there, and I'm like, what does it mean to, to like, for them to, to stretch across the gulf? And because of that, they'll, they'll lay hold on, on spiritualism. But then I think about that parable. You know, what does that rich man believe? That you can cross that great gulf. But in reality, although some people, which I, I can't say is not true, they say, look, I talked to my, my dead relatives. This is true. I'm not going to say they're lying, but I'm just going to say that's probably not their relative. <laughs> it's just like this idea, like if you believe that you can, you can cross this gulf, which I believe is talking about the parable, stretching your hand out, trying to communicate with someone. You are going to communicate with someone, but it's not going to be who you think it is. <laughs> but rather, it's going to be that of lying spirits. And this is why I believe in this passage, it mentions the Protestants, when they, when they, when they have this idea that you can communicate with the dead, they're going to reach across that gulf that God, that God put. And it's like, you know, they're going to get reception, but it's through spiritualism. And touching more about this idea of, of being conscious while you're dead. It says, the belief that the spirits of the dead return to minister to the living has prepared the way for modern spiritualism. And we're given a lot of warnings when it comes to people coming back from life, 
or not only back from life, but specifically like coming to you in the form of spirits, like, like, like this is me. Like, I'm your friend. It says, he, speaking about Satan, has power to bring before men the appearance of their departed friends. The counterfeit is perfect. The familiar look, the words, the tone are reproduced with marvelous distinctness. In other words, they're going, they're going to speak just like how your friend spoke. They're going to act how he acted. And you're going to think it's your friend, but it's not your friend. He even says that the apostles, as personated by these lying spirits, in other words, there's going to come up, someone's going to come up to you and say, I'm Paul, or I'm Matthew. You know what I wrote? It doesn't mean that. You know, that was done at the cross. They might use that. But we are not to believe that because it says are made to contradict what I just said, what they wrote at the dictation of the Holy Spirit when on earth. Now, again, there's going to be many deceptions in the last days. And this is why I believe in this parable. He, really, Jesus really says, like, look, to Moses, they have Moses and the prophets. Likewise, likewise with us. We don't really need someone to come back from the dead. <laughs> Or, or someone to come to communicate with you in the, in the form of the Spirit because we have the Word of God. We don't, we don't really need that. We don't need this manifestation like, to, to really prove our case. It's like, no, no, no. Because of the Word of God, it says it, it is so. And those who, who really use that foundation of like, you know, what they see as something true, it's dangerous. And Satan knows that, and he will take advantage of it. Now, notice, when it comes to, to the scriptures, it says, you know, try the spirits. And there's one, one inter interesting phrase about the spirits. It says, every spirit, and this is in 1 John, well, it's up there. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. Now, that word for flesh is sarx, which is, from what I've seen, is like, like us. So, if, if this spirit, he comes to you and say, look, Jesus has come. He's just like you. He's come in the flesh. He's of God. But notice, it says, And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. It even uses strong words. It says, This is that spirit of Antichrist. But then, okay, just to, just to level, it, level it out, we are also told that, you know, not only... We are to be careful when they say, look, look, Jesus is just divine. You know, he's not, he's not like you. You have to be careful with that. But at the same time, you have to be careful of the other spectrum, where the spirits are going to come up to you and say, look, it says here, the spirits deny the divinity of Christ and place even the, the creator on a level with themselves. In other words, the spirits, this is bad too, where they say, look, Christ, he's not divine. He's just like you. All the way, he's not divine. That also, I would even say, is the spirit of Antichrist. You, you, there's two extremes right there. You can't, you, know, you can't really say, okay, Jesus, he's a man, but he's not divine. You know, spirits will come and teach you that. And we learn right there, it's like, that's wrong. But the op opposite spectrum is wrong too. That's why I just wanted to bring that out in case. But again... It just shows we really have to be careful because here it says, again, many people that are skeptical in the last days are like, you know, these, these people aren't seeing anything. They're a little, little, you know, they need a little screws in their, in their heads to, because they're, they're not really seeing that. But here it says in this passage, many will be ensnared through the belief that spiritualism is a merely human imposter. It says, when brought face to face with manifestations, which they cannot but regard as supernatural, they will be deceived and will be led to accept them as the great power of God. It's gonna, there's people. Even before I was skeptical, I was like, you know, these people say, you know, I saw this person and he, he manifested to me. It's like, oh, I don't know. I don't, I don't really, before I didn't believe it. And, and communication was like, the spirits or anything like that. Or, but then again, I wasn't a Christian at all before. 
But here it says, these same people, Satan is going to deceive. Because what are you going to do when, when a spirit is like right, then, right there, right in front of you? You can't say no to that. So of course you see it. And, and it's going to le- lead to them to accept it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's dangerous. Now, the great controversy is very specific about the last days. And here it mentions about Satan. He studies, you know, how, how, how the world works. He studies like the laboratories of nature. And he's able, it says here, he uses all his power to control the elements as far as God allows. But then it mentions, okay, look, he's going to cause calamities. He's going to cause earthquakes. He's going to cause tornadoes. All of these different things. And you know what, what will be used? It says, it will be declared that men are offending God by the violation of the Sunday Sabbath, that this sin has brought calamities. What calamities? Those that we just saw. Natural disasters. These natural calamities are brought because they were breaking the Sabbath. And, and they will not stop. It says, that, which will not cease until Sunday sacredness shall be strictly enforced. Here is, is very specific how, how really what's going to be used as an argument to, to bring in this, this Sunday sacredness. And that is through natural disasters. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> and, and also, you know, just to top it off, it even mentions that, you know, communications from the spirits will declare that God has sent them to con- convince the rejectors of Sunday of their error. And it says, affirming that the laws of the land should be obeyed as the law of God. So because of these people, they, they believe that you can still communicate with, with the dead. Spirits are going to come in forms of the apostles and say, look, you know why all these calamities are happening? Because of those people. And not only that, but it will not stop until those people are out. You have to get rid of them. Can you, can you really see that? Before, I'll tell you. I mean, before, when I first started to become Adventist, I was working for the military. And when I found out about, you know, the, the, the beast and Revelation 13 being the United States, I don't know about that, you know. I, I, <laughs> I, I wasn't going to, you know, say that until, can't really go into all description. But I will say in the year 2020, I, I saw certain movements that really shook me in, 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 in where I worked at. It's like, wow, these people are are willing to, to do what it takes to, to do what they have to do. And it really, it really convicted me because I would make mortar rounds, which is like bombs. And it's like, oh, no. So here I am helping them <laughs> make it. And I just remember praying to God. It's like, Lord, forgive me, because I remember we had a meeting, and, and, they, and they told us, like, look. I forgot it was recording. But okay. <laughs> How can I say it? Basically, be ready to move. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> and with that, I was like, whoa, now I can definitely see. I can definitely see that characteristic of, of like, you know, this nation even. Although, sadly, it was founded upon freedom. It can be switched really quick for the sake of, you know, for the common good. And... Again, just talking about spiritualism, the crowning act in the great controversy, it brings out that Satan himself will impersonate Christ. He will come in the same manner, just like Jesus, how it describes in Revelation by John the Revelator. He's going to come, it even says he's going to say the same words, the same sayings. He's even going to heal people. Now, how that all works, I don't understand. But what I do understand is to the law and to the prophets. And they speak not according to this. It is because there is no light in them. Although we might, not, we might see all these things. We might see, I mean, this being, it's just, he looks holy. But yet, if he teaches error, that is the spirit of Antichrist. And again, that's why we, we cannot go by what we see, but what 
what is written. And with that, I just wanted to say, again, study to show thyself approved. Rightly, you must, we must rightly divide the word of truth. And this is what I've seen when it comes to the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Is not only you know, a lesson for, for, the, for the Pharisees to say, look, riches is not going to take you to, to where you think you're going to go. But in the fact is, you, you have to live righteously. And not only that, but this warning of, of like, be careful about believing, you know, you can communicate with those who are already dead. So I hope that really makes sense. And by God's grace, help us to, to really strive to know what saith the Lord and not what men says and what we see too. So with that, we can sing our closing hymn, which is hymn number 596. Please stand. Let's pray one more time. Father, I'm praying, Lord, that you may help us to, to look for those way marks and to be aware that, that really your coming is soon. But, but before your coming, Lord, there, there will be many deceptions. Father, help us to take heed of your word lest we fall. Help us to, to be founded upon the rock and not upon sand. Help us to, to walk by faith and not by sight, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that although the majority are, are going the other way, help us to stand firm to you and for you in a loving way as well, Father. Help us to, to be a witness to this world. And Father, there are many people who, who, who have this idea. Lord, help us to, to, to really show little by little through love, Father, and, and not through uh, means of, of really condemning them, but Father, guiding them through the Holy Spirit and praying for them. Help us, Lord, because we do not know everything. Therefore, guide us into, into all truth. For this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.